Shalom family, this is Brother Eliah, and today we'll be discussing the Song of Moses. As it relates to the prophesied awakening of true Israel, the Song of Moses is probably the most significant chapter in the scriptures next to Deuteronomy 28. Moses was shown Israel's entire future during his sojourn in the wilderness as Yah's chief prophet. He was shown that they would break the Holy Covenant and suffer the curses of Deuteronomy 28 until the end of days. Moses was shown all of this before the Israelites had even set foot in the promised land. Remember, Yah always authenticates his word by telling us the end from the beginning in accordance with Isaiah 46 verses 9 through 11. The Song of Moses is so important that it will be sung by the triumphant saints who have resisted the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the last seven plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of Elohim. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of Elohim. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of Elohim, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Yahuwah Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Yahuwah, and glorify thy name? For thou art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. The Song of Moses was written primarily as a testimony against us for our sins as a nation. It also, of course, serves as a major witness that the scriptures themselves are true. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 15 through 21. And Yahuwah appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Behold, Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me, and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them. So that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us because our Elohim is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. Now therefore, write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Yisrael. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Yisrael. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination, which they go about, even now, before I have brought them into the land which I swear. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 22 through 30. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day, and taught it to the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge, and said, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book, until they were finished, 
that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah your Elohim, that it may be there for a witness against thee. For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against Yahuwah, and how much more after my death. Gather unto me the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of Yahuwah, and provoke him to anger through the work of your hands." And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Yisrael the words of this song until they were ended. Moses prophesies that the Israelites will rebel against the Holy Covenant and bring misery and suffering upon themselves. So without further ado, let's get into the song itself. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 1 through 9. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of Yahuwah, ascribe ye greatness unto our Elohim. He is the rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, an Elohim of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requite Yahuwah, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Yisrael. For Yahuwah's portion is his people. Yaakov is the lot of his inheritance. Yah's inheritance is his people. We are his peculiar treasure. And this sentiment is expressed over and over and over again throughout the scriptures. So this notion that the true children of Yisrael no longer matter is utterly asinine. That replacement theology does not line up with the scriptures. The next section of the Song of Moses discusses how Yah will bless his people and set them on high only to be utterly betrayed by them. Let's go ahead and read it. Deuteronomy 32 verses 10 through 15. He found him in a desert land and in the waste, howling wilderness, he led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so Yahuwah alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him to ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock, and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine, and milk of sheep, with fat of lambs, and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats, with the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. But Jeshurun waxed fat, and kicked, thou art waxen fat, Thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook Elohim, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock 
of his salvation. The name Jeshurun or Yeshurun in the Hebrew is a poetic name for Israel, by the way. Picking up at verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoke they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils and not to Elohim, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom that your fathers feared not. So Moses prophesied in his song that once Jeshurun or Yisrael became prosperous, the nation would forsake the Holy Covenant and fail to appreciate Yah, leading them down the road to idolatry and eventually their destruction as a nation. So when did this slide begin? During the reign of King Solomon, the greatest ruler that Israel had ever known. Let's check the accounts. Second Chronicles 9, picking up at verse 13. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred and three score and six talents of gold. Beside that which chapmen and merchants brought, and all the kings of Arabia and governors of the country brought gold and silver to Solomon. And King Solomon made two hundred targets of beaten gold. Six hundred shekels of beaten gold went to one target. And three hundred shields made he of beaten gold. Three hundred shekels of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with pure gold. And there were six steps to the throne, with the footstool of gold, which were fastened to the throne, and stays on each side of the sitting place, and two lions standing by the stays. And twelve lions stood there on the one side, and on the other upon the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom. And all the drinking vessels of King Solomon were of gold. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was not anything accounted of in the days of Solomon. For the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Huram. Every three years once came the ships of Tarshish bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Picking up at verse 23, And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that Elohim had put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and raiment, harness and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year, and Solomon had four thousand stalls for horses and chariots, and twelve thousand horsemen, whom he bestowed in the chariot cities, and with the king at Jerusalem. And he reigned over all the kings from the river, even unto the land of the Philistines, and to the border of Egypt. And the king made silver in Jerusalem as stones, and cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees that are in the low plains in abundance. And they brought unto Solomon horses out of Egypt and out of all lands. Under the reign of King Solomon, Yisrael prospered immensely. This is when he led our people down the road to idolatry, as prophesied in the Song of Moses. Let's get to it. 1 Kings chapter 11 But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites of the nations concerning which Yahuwah said unto the children of Yisrael, Ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, 
and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with Yahuwah his Elohim, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of Yahuwah, and went not fully after Yahuwah, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Solomon failed in three areas of the covenant as king which ultimately led up to his greatest failure as an idolatrous ruler. Let's go to the book of the law to get understanding. Deuteronomy chapter 17, picking up at verse 14. When thou art come into the land which Yahuwah thy Elohim giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom Yahuwah thy Elohim shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as Yahuwah hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart not turn away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So we see that according to Torah, a king is not to multiply horses, wives, or wealth to himself. The accumulation of these things leads to a lack of reliance on Yah as protector and provider. As we see with Solomon, his numerous wives turned his heart from Yah, just as Deuteronomy 17 and 17 specifically warned against. Once King Solomon himself started down the road of idolatry, the nation of Yisrael was divided into two kingdoms upon his death, and idolatry and abominable sins began to plague us as a people. This ultimately led to our downfall to the Assyrians and Babylonians, as decreed by Yah as judgment for our sins. So let's return to our subject text. Deuteronomy chapter 32, picking up at verse 18. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten Elohim that formed thee. And when Yahuwah saw it, he abhorred them, because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them, I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not Elohim. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Yah said that he would hide his face from us and leave us to the consequences of our sins. In addition, he also decreed that he would provoke us to jealousy by raising up a people who are not a people. See, Yah has a fantastic sense of humor, and many people fail to catch it in the scriptures. In the same way that we made him jealous by cleaving to false deities, he promised to make us jealous by allowing a strange heathen people to steal our identity. Yep. That would be the Khazars. 
They are those which are not a true people, by the way. They're a curious admixture of Japhetic tribes. Let's prove that from their own writings. Arthur Kessler, a Jewish writer, wrote the following on page 6 of his book, The Thirteenth Tribe. In the first century AD, the Chinese drove these disagreeable Hun neighbors westward, and thus started one of those periodic avalanches which swept for many centuries from Asia toward the west. From the 5th century onward, many of these westward-bound tribes were called by the generic name of Turks. The term is also supposed to be of Chinese origin, apparently derived from the name of a hill, and was subsequently used to refer to all tribes who spoke languages with certain common characteristics, the Turkic language group. Thus, the term Turk, in the sense in which it was used by medieval writers, often also by modern ethnologists, refers primarily to language and not to race. So in other words, these people are not related to the people of Turkey. Catch that. Moving forward. In this sense, the Huns and Khazars were Turkic people, but not the Magyars, whose language belongs to the Finno-Ugrian language group. The Khazar language was supposedly a Chuvash dialect of Turkish, which still survives in the autonomous Chuvash Soviet Republic between the Volga and the Sura. The Chuvash people are actually believed to be descendants of the Bulgars, who spoke a dialect similar to the Khazars, but all these connections are rather tenuous based on the more or less speculative deductions of oriental philologists. Philologists is someone who studies ancient texts. All we can say with safety is that the Khazars were a quote-unquote Turkic tribe who erupted from the Asian steppes, probably in the 5th century of our era. The origin of the name Khazar and the modern derivations to which it gave rise has also been the subject of much ingenious speculation. Most likely the word is derived from the Turkish root Gaz, to wander, and simply means nomad. So in other words, these Khazars are a blend of nomadic tribes who emerged from the Asian steppes at some point in the 5th century. That comes from one of their own family. We were prophesied to be provoked to jealousy by those which are not a true people. Prophecy fulfilled. Let's get back to the Song of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 32, picking up at verse 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them, I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger, and devoured with burning heat, and with bitter destruction, and I will send the teeth of beasts upon them, with the poison of the serpents of the dust. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. This is the final judgment on our people. We would be conquered, abused, scattered all over the world, and we would not only forget our own heritage, but we would be forgotten by all mankind. This judgment is echoed throughout the scriptures by the prophets and even by the Messiah himself. Let's go there. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 1 through 4. 
The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart, and upon the horns of your altars. Whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. O my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil, and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders, and thou... Even thyself shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not, for ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Notice how the exact same language is used here as in the excerpt from the Song of Moses that we just read, Deuteronomy 32 and 22. Let's get into the conspiracy of nations prophesied by King David. Psalm 83 verses 1 through 5. Keep not thou silence, O Elohim. Hold not thy peace and be not still, O Elohim. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Yisrael may no more be in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. King David, also a prophet, saw that the nations would work together to blot out our memory. They succeeded. It is literally by the hand of Yah that we are awakening in the last days and bringing forth the truth of who we are. It's the fulfillment of of a few prophecies, most notably Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 1 through 3, as well as Joel 2.28 and Acts 2.17. Anyway, let's keep it moving. The prophet Hosea, chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yeah, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. My Elohim will cast them away, because they did not hearken unto him, and they shall be wanderers among the nations. The Messiah also delivered a prophecy concerning the final judgment of the Yehudim. Luke chapter 21 and 24 reads, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. After the prophesied destruction of the temple in 70 AD, our ancestors fled into West Africa. From there, we were scattered into all nations through the transatlantic and trans-Saharan slave trade. After this time, we became known not as Israelites or Hebrews, but as Negroes or Africans or niggers, spooks, coons, slaves. We have been forgotten, and so has our ancestry. Prophecy fulfilled, scattered into corners, our remembrance has ceased from among men. Back to the subject text. Deuteronomy chapter 32, picking up at verse 27. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, our hand is high, and Yahuwah hath not done all this. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, and that they would consider their latter end. How should one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and Yahuwah had shut them up? For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine 
is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Yah is now referring to the enemies of Yisrael, declaring that they would be lifted up in their pride in the last days and would actually believe themselves to be innately superior to the chosen people. In other words, Yah told the children of Yisrael about white supremacy thousands of years before it manifested. Moreover, Yah knew that the nations, the Goyim, would be lifted up in pride because Yah would be forced to humble his people in order to end their rebellion against him. However, Yah also vowed to destroy the enemies of Yisrael as a punishment for their harsh treatment of his chosen seed. Let's read about it. Deuteronomy 32, picking up at verse 34. Is this not laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For Yahuwah shall judge his people, and repent himself for his servants, when he seeth that their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted? which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. And that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. So before we get into the myriad prophecies concerning the judgment of the nations, I really want to emphasize the fact that Yah will render vengeance on our enemies. We do not have the power to deliver ourselves, as verse 36 in the Song of Moses makes abundantly clear. Vengeance belongs to Yah. So you can put your little pop guns back in the safe Hebrew. You don't have enough bullets to go to war with any sovereign nation, let alone the worldwide superpower known as the United States of America. Sit back and let Yah destroy your enemies. Your job is to keep the commandments and teach others to do likewise. Now, let's discuss the grisly fate of those who have persecuted us. Isaiah 49 and 26 and I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine. Mm, that's not very pleasant. And all flesh shall know that I, Yahuwah, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Pretty sure that Yah's got this, y'all. But let's move right along to the judgment of the nations in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, prophesied by Joel and echoed again in the book of Revelation. Joel chapter 3, starting at verse 1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Yisrael, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Yeah, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon? In all the coasts of Palestine, will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me, 
swiftly and speedily will I return your recompense upon your own head. Because ye have taken my silver and my gold, and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Tyre and Zidon. These are Canaanite tribes. Hamites. Today, you'd call them Africans. These are specific bands of so-called Africans who sold us to the Europeans. This is their judgment. Verse 7. Behold, I will raise them, being Judah, out of the places whither ye have sold them, and I will return your recompense upon your own head, and I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off, for Yahuwah hath spoken it. The Sabians are a Cushite tribe, Ethiopians. The word derives from Sheba, Remember the queen of Sheba? Solomon's lover? Machida? Mother of Menelech? Yep, them. Picking up at verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords, and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves, and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Yah. Let the heathen be wakened, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of Yahuwah is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Yah shall also roar out of Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But Yahuwah will be the hope of his people, and the strength of the children of Yisrael. So shall ye know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountain shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of Yahuwah, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. Quick note here. Based on Isaiah chapter 34, verses 5 through 10, the lake of fire will be located in the land of Edom. Notice the descriptive language used in verses 9 and 10. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Now, let's cross-reference this with the description of the lake of fire in the book of Revelation, chapter 14 and verses 9 through 11. Check this. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, 
If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Elohim, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest night nor day who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name see that same language Edom one of the chief enemies of Israel will have its lands utterly destroyed and changed into the lake of fire remember the lake of fire is near the kingdom where the lamb will set up his throne Edom is directly south to southeast of Judea now Edom also being in northern Arabia is full of pitch pitch is derived from petroleum oil that pitch will be set on fire and it will burn forever just like Isaiah prophesied makes perfect sense now right so let's move on to the judgment of the nations prophesied in revelation 19 i hope you didn't mind going on this quick rabbit trail with me revelation chapter 19 beginning in verse 11 and i saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Yah. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty Yah. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Master of Masters. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great Elohim, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That is the judgment of all the enemies of Yisrael. The takeaway, Yah will do it far better than we can. So just let our Abba do his thing. Stop marching in the streets. You can also stop whispering in your basement about armed insurrection. That didn't work for the Black Panthers then, and it won't work for us now. Let's finish up the Song of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 43 through 45. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and he will render vengeance to his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his land and to his people.
And Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people, he and Hoshea, the son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Yisrael. At the end of it all, Yah will render vengeance upon all his enemies and will have mercy upon the remnant of the children of Yisrael. And when our kingdom rises, it will stand forever. The Song of Moses demonstrates once again that Yah shows his authority by telling us the end from the beginning. Teach this song to your brothers and sisters and to your children. Remember it and recognize that at the end of days, this song will be sung in the heavens. As always, I appreciate your time, family. I give all praise to the Most High and glory and honor to the King of Kings, Yeshua HaMashiach. Please consider supporting the Ministry of the Word. My PayPal link is attached in the video description. Shalom, and I'll see you next video.